Hello, everyone. Welcome to an inside look at TrendsWatch 2016. This special event is presented by BlackBot in collaboration with the American Alliance Museums. Your host today is Elizabeth Merritt, Vice President, Strategic Foresight, and Founding Director at the Center for the Future of Museums, a division of the American Alliance of Museums. One piece of housekeeping before we get started, you should see a Q&A widget on your screen. You can use that to submit questions during the webinar. Elizabeth will do her best to take them as they come, but any that we don't get to during the presentation, we will take at the end of the session. And without further delay, I will turn it over to Elizabeth to introduce her special guest. Elizabeth? Thank you, Laura, and thank you for all of you joining us today. For me, this is a very special opportunity to explore a couple of the trends in this year's report, both with you, the audience, who I hope will be lobbing questions at us throughout, and with two special guests. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Barry Joseph, who is the Associate Director for Digital Learning at the American Museum of Natural History. Barry provided much of the inspiration for the chapter on augmented and virtual reality, so I'm really looking forward to getting his expert take on it. And when we come to the second half of our program, exploring happiness as a metric of, express, of success, we're going to be joined by Gregory Dreiser, who is Director of Curatorial and Engagement at the Museum of Vancouver, a museum I always keep an eye on because they're always doing such fabulous things, including, uh, in this case, hosting an exhibit on happiness to try and improve the happiness of their community. And with that, let me jump right in. The first thing we're going to be looking at today is uh, a section on augmented and virtual reality, which I shamelessly named Me, We, Here, There, which is pulled directly from Barry Joseph's matrix of looking at augmented devices. Um, and I looked at, I want, really wanted to look at this question of technology because it seems that museums in general always have a very fraught relationship with technology. We always have anxiety attacks about whether it's here to supplant what we do, whether it's going to replace the physical experience, or whether we can use it to extend and supplement our interpretation. And augmented and virtual reality really goes right to the heart of that anxiety, because if there's anything that could ever replace the real thing, it's increasingly sophisticated forms of digital experiences that mimic the real thing. What I'm going to do is run us very quickly through the four quadrants of this matrix to, to line up Barry's comments, and just share a couple of thoughts that I had as I was developing the report about why we should be looking at this. Okay, so the first quadrant in the matrix are devices that look at me here. So we're looking at two different axes here. We're looking at whether we are having a social or a solitary experience, and we're looking at whether that experience is taking place somewhere else or whether it's enhancing the environment we're actually in. In this case, it's a solitary experience taking place in my real environment. And this isn't, in the grand scheme of things, particularly new. Uh, we began seeing really cool augmented reality apps that were being used by museums six, seven years ago. One of the things that really caught my attention at the time was this was a way that people could begin to personalize their experiences with museums. So it wasn't everybody moving through the museum seeing exactly the same things and having the same experience, just the way that audio guides used to give you a, a personalized narrative, something that other people weren't hearing, this could give you a personalized visual experience, seeing things other people weren't seeing. But if you're delivering that through a smartphone or a tablet, it's still pretty clunky because you're having to hold up this big device in front of you to see this overlay on the real environment. So as time went on, of course, the technologists tried to tackle this, and we had the, introdu the introduction of technologies like Google Glass, which tried to make it more seamless by turning it into a wearable. Uh, I tried out Glass for about a year. It's, it's pretty much the inevitable idea. How could you have something that you could become pretty much unaware of? It could just be something that's always sitting there that you could activate by touch or voice that would begin to augment your environment. And while Google Glass is off the market, while they're refocusing it on business applications, there are lots of equivalent products in, in development by Vuzik and Sony, Sony and others. So at some point, we're going to have a wearable that, that delivers augmented reality. 
That's, however, something that only enhances what I'm actually looking at and is just for me alone. So the next quadrant of Barry's matrix that we want to look at are experiences that can take me elsewhere, that can transport me to a different world, either a real world, in this case the LA Symphony, trying to immerse people in the experience of sitting in the symphony and hearing the music from all around them, or worlds we can't access anymore, different times, different places, other planets, or imaginary worlds. This is a way of reaching people who might never step into a museum past our doors to give them a hint of what it might like to be in the museum, just the way the LA Phil sent their van out on the road offering people a, a, a virtual reality experience of what it would be like if they actually came to the symphony. Now, this is starting to become more accessible. Uh, Oculus Rift, which is one of the big names in, in this area, started shipping in March, and it costs about $600. That doesn't count the cost of a personal computer that can actually support the set and runs the kind of software it needs to interface with. But on the other hand, you've got really, really uh, inexpensive devices for delivering virtual reality. Many of you may have a, a Google Cardboard, which was shipped to all New York Times subscribers last November, and they're now shipping it out to loyal digital-only subscribers um, in last month and this month. And even if you had to buy it off the web, you can get a, a Google Cardboard device for you know, about 14 bucks. The cool thing about this is there's an increasing amount of science showing that this kind of immersive virtual reality, putting you in a different world, putting you into a refugee camp to see what it's like to be a kid having to rely on food drops, or uh, putting you into uh, another country or the shoes of another person, can really promote pro-social attitudes and behavior. It, it hits all of the neural triggers in your brain that real experiences do. It can actually trigger empathy, can trigger emotion. So these can be tremendously effective ways to try and engage people's interest and engage their, their sympathies with your topic. But of course, it's immensely more powerful if you can share experiences. And this, this is where we get to the we part of the matrix. How can we all be sharing these same digital experiences? And it also gets incredibly practical and powerful here. So I've got a shot in this picture of a uh, virtual operating room where different people who could be based at different hospitals can log in and participate as team members in practicing what it's like to operate in the OR. I think this has immense applications for museums. Just as a former collections manager, I'm really jazzed by the idea of running simulated emergency preparedness drills in a virtual museum where we each get to play our part, helping getting people out of the museum or, or rescuing the objects from rising waters or dealing with a fire, things that would be very difficult and expensive to simulate, but we could actually train as a team in those environments. But the other thing is, even if you're looking at it in terms of educational experiential learning, uh, think of all the places that you would like to be able to take groups of people so that they could learn together uh, into the distant past. They could all be attending the Constitutional Convention. They could be wandering around um, a, a Cretaceous landscape together, uh, seeing the animals and the plants. And it could be a more powerful learning experience uh, because they're sharing these things. But as Barry has pointed out, the real sweet spot for museums is the we here quadrant of the matrix. Shared digital experiences that overlay information and images on the real environment you're in. Now this is a somewhat creepy photograph of three guys who are all wearing HoloLens. And they're all gesturing at something that they an imaginary digital object they're all looking at and manipulating, but they're sharing this experience. I actually got to try out a HoloLens at the annual meeting, and it was incredible because I was standing there, I'm sure, looking like a total dork in the um, exhibit hall, and I was seeing myself in the ancient Roman forum, looking around and seeing people walking around me and in an overlay that, that put itself in the actual exhibit hall of, of uh, the Museum Expo. Now, there are obvious 
really uh, powerful and, and interesting gaming applications for this, and that's why a lot of people are pouring money into it, because it has really great uh, applications for gaming where there's a lot of money. So you're already seeing people saying, well, you could have people play fantasy football and manipulate players on a, on a table um, by wearing HoloLens, where you're both seeing the same game. And really, this isn't a new idea. I'm sure many of you are old enough or have watched uh, in reruns Star Wars, where there was a famous scene where Chewbacca and C-3PO were playing this holographic game with, with all sorts of alien critters. That's basically the kind of experience that you can create with a shared augmented reality device like HoloLens. But as with many technologies that are developed primarily for a big commercial market, it has incredible spin-off value for places like museums that can draft on those developments. It creates new formats for storytelling. Um, it can revitalize old industries. This is why the New York Times, I think, is, is pouring itself into uh, uh, immersive journalism and, and sending out Google Cardboard. They're hoping that VR can act as an empathy engine that will engage people with stories in a way that print journalism currently isn't. So it's got real potential for, uh, as a way for museums to reach beyond our walls and engage the interest and empathy of people uh, who we want to involve in our work. So with that introduction, I want to go ahead and bring Barry online so he can tell us more about his matrix, which he developed. Barry, are you on the line now? Here I am. Hey. Hi, Elizabeth. That was a Thanks great Thanks for having me here noise. today with you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm so glad to have you. So, and I what should say that... What a beautiful job you did describing uh, uh, this framework. Thank you so much. I feel like I can go home now. <laughs> Which, and you. And now that I ha now that I have this sl now you're off not off the hook because I mean you came up with this over a year ago so I'm yeah. I'm going to push you on revisiting it because right. uh, we haven't talked about this in a while I want to know first of all are you, are you still finding it a useful way to frame your thinking about AR and VR in museums and what has come across your radar since then that may have extended your thinking Oh absolutely I found myself using it all the time I'm an ed tech person which means I tend to be inclined towards the technology even though I'm trying to think about the educational affordances. So part of what I found so useful is that this doesn't describe the tools at all, um, what has wires and what doesn't, or are you wearing it on your head or not. It's describing the effect it has on you as the user, both from um, a social perspective and from a spatial perspective. And so I can give you two recent examples, actually. One, uh, a sporting example and a museum one. Um, let's see, sporting. So I was at a baseball game. Uh, just a few weeks ago with my family, we were seeing the Mets, and growing up, I loved going to see the Mets, because whether they won or whether they lost, I always got to have a box of Cracker Jacks, uh, which I loved eating, but my favorite part was getting the prize. You know, you always get a prize inside your, your box of Cracker Jacks, some little toy you can play with. Uh, and we're watching the game a few weeks ago, and I got my box of Cracker Jacks. I hadn't been in a while, and I was surprised, because what I, I pulled out of the box you know, surrounded by the, the yummy caramel popcorn, wasn't a little toy. It was just a, a little a piece of paper that when I opened it up, had a sticker on it, and the sticker was an augmented reality target. And what it invited me to do was to download an app uh, and put it uh, uh, focused on the sticker, and it told me it was going to give me a baseball-themed game. Well, immediately I wasn't happy. First of all, I wanted my physical object because I was expecting that. But more importantly... I was, it was a disconnect for what I was doing at the baseball game. Uh, being at the baseball game with my family was social. We were experiencing something together there, and I wanted to watch the game. The idea of spending time personally going to the app store and downloading the app uh, and then being able to look at it myself on my phone – uh, and then play a game which was, uh, albeit baseball-themed, had nothing to do with what was happening at the real baseball game at the moment. So being able to think about um, not only that I didn't like it, but why, um, using the framework was helpful for me. It was, I needed something social. I needed something we, but it ended up being on the me side. And I needed something that was about keeping me where I was in the here space. Instead, it was trying to send me there, somewhere else. Um, so very quickly, the, the framework helped me go, okay, this is why – uh, it's not to say that augmented reality couldn't be used at a baseball game, but that wasn't what I'd want to do there. Um, at the same time, recently I was down in D.C., uh, your neck of the woods, at the National Museum uh, of, Amer of uh, Natural History for, during the AIM conference, 
and we went to the room called the, the, the I think it's called the Bone Room. It's one of the oldest uh, rooms at the museum, and it's lots of bones um, of uh, different animals. And they created um, an app called Skin and Bones, and you it's hard to miss it. As soon as you walk in, there are signs that tell you about it. There are spots that tell you where you can stand. And even the website, when you go to the information about the hall, it's actually all about the app. And what the app does is, just like it's described, it puts skin on the bones. So all hmm. these bones that you see and trying to figure out what these animals are, this app lets you hold up the phone. So there's an experience of uh, you, or, your, or as I did with my family, holding it in front of the bones, and then suddenly I got to see the skin on it. I got to see what the animal actually looked like. And many of them actually were um, uh, uh, um, then initiating some movement. So how did it climb or how did it walk? So it took this very static thing behind glass and it brought it to life. And that was something that I enjoyed a lot. So why did I enjoy it using the Matrix? Well, I was there to experience the museum with my family. And so we together had fun holding up the device and trying to connect it and seeing what it might do. And it had me notice the space I was in. I was there to look at the objects. So again, the, the Matrix was helpful for me from a, a social and a spatial perspective to see why the design of that augmented experience um, gave me something that I really enjoyed. So yes, a year out, I, I still, Elizabeth, find it uh, tremendously useful to help me understand not only what I want to see in our museum here in New York at the American Museum of Natural History, but why the things that I see offered in the world, whether a commercial product that's a, in my Cracker Jacks box or an educational experience in the Museum of D.C. might or might not be working. Well, that's really interesting. I was listening to a talk the other day about what kind of interactions take place between parents and kids that have the highest impact on, on kids' learning and create um, experiences that they really remember later. And the speaker was saying that a characteristic of the highest impact interactions are when the, the child and the adult are both looking at the same thing and having a back and forth, a substantive back and forth about what they were seeing or conjecture about it. And it seems to me that, that actually being able to share that and the, the fictional experience of seeing what the animal would have looked like when it had skin or when it was alive gives you more to talk about. Uh, I've had people talk to me in the, in the past about how there's a gap, for example, in natural history museums between people who know enough that, to fuel their imagination about what a dinosaur would have looked like when it was alive or what the fish would have looked like when it was alive. And, but there are people coming in without that kind of background. So how do you have a meaningful shared conversation about that imaginary whole animal? And there's an example where augmented reality can give them a common place to have those rich interactions. Yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely correct, Elizabeth. I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, that's one of the basis of um, our most recent augmented reality experience here at the A M H called Micro Rangers, which um, is a, a a mobile game that uh, invites the visitors to shrink down to the microscopic level and go inside our exhibits, our permanent exhibits, behind the glass, uh, and interact with both virtual scientists and, and microbes to solve threats to biodiversity. And at many of the beats along the way, we try, intentionally tried to create points where we are asking the players to look at something so that the, the family or the group that's there together um, are looking together at the exhibit and then talking about it and making a decision. So you might be at um, a wall that's full of all sorts of beautiful coral, and the game says pick which coral you want to shrink down and go inside and take a photo of it. So it, it creates an opportunity for the, the, the family unit to look together and then make a decision and then act on that decision together together using the device. Um, and we try to create as many moments as we can where the, we're asking people to look at something. We're asking the players to look together and make decisions. That's, that's really nice. I, I think that we have a parallel here. A lot of times when people are, are grumbling a little bit about technology in museums, and the technology could be as simple as a, uh, a cell phone with which you're taking photographs, and people worry about whether that's distracting attention, taking attention away from the real thing. Uh, and I think I've seen a number of persuasive essays saying that they are mechanisms, they can be mechanisms for focusing attention. So that the act of composing a photograph and choosing what you're going to take a picture of and is that capturing what you want it to see or with an augmented or virtual reality app directing your attention to look for something or find something or compare something can actually give people a scaffold for a kind of attentive viewing that they might not come in prepared to do on their own. Absolutely. I mean, we know working in museums that the, the more museum literate the visitors are, the more they can get out of the experience. 
and in a museum like a natural history museum, we have high expectations for how a visitor can take meaning from it on their own without other scaffoldings as opposed to, say, an interactive yeah. science center, right? So being yeah. able to train visitors how to look and how to gain meaning from looking um, not only helps them learn more, it makes them want to come back, and it makes their, their experience of, of the natural world um, in our context richer for them. So to the extent that we can use augmented reality to train visitors how to look and develop those skills or use the skills they already have and strengthen them, um, then augmented reality, rather than disconnecting them from the museum experience, is actually going to enhance it, not just for that, I think but for the future. And I think that's the way to start thinking about how to use these technologies. Uh, I think to go back to your Cracker Jack analogy, it's almost as if somebody sat down and said, well, how can we, how can we shovel this technology into the box rather than starting from the kind of experience they wanted people to have? So uh, now I'm, I want to go back and think in my head, if I were sitting in that baseball park, what kind of augmented or virtual reality experience would I want to have? And I guess maybe for me, knowing very little about baseball, if I could have a shared augmented reality app that displayed facts about the players above their heads as I was looking at them, uh, it might give me something to talk about with the person next to me who knew more about them or knew more about baseball than I did. Yeah, baseball is a game of statistics. And so when you're sitting there um, looking around the stadium, you're looking at numbers that are all over the place, the speed of the ball, um, the status of the batter, how many strikes uh, are, are they facing, how many balls so far. Um, the, the, the batting average of the batter might be up on the screen. Um, so there's just numbers everywhere. But that's the designers of the baseball stadium experience trying to figure out what do you want to know, when do you want to know it, and how do they put it where you want to see it. An augmented experience like you described can let you be in control of that process. So if my child asks me something about somebody in left field, if I can hold up my phone and, and, and see their number in some context, and they can show me that information, then it can give me the information I want personalized to my family's needs on demand. Yeah, and back to the personalization again, because I think that's a tremendously right. powerful thing about these apps. That's right. Now, as you so, mentioned, uh, these, these ideas, um, uh, th as I started thinking about them, aren't new. They've been These devices and the experience have been around for a while. But last year when I started trying to frame just for myself how to understand its impact in museums, most of this was conceptual. I, too, had, had um, an opportunity to try Google Glass, but everything else was just something we were reading about. You know, We were reading about what these devices m might do in our lives. 2016 is very different than 2015. This is the year we actually get to play with so many of these devices, either because they're for sale or because the developer kits are available as well. Um, and it's been exciting now to see us not only talk about them in the conceptual space, but because we're actually getting to try things that people are making. You experience, for example, being able to experience, um, was it the Coliseum you mentioned, or is it something else? Yeah. Yeah. The Coliseum, right? I had another experience of the Coliseum as well. When I was at AAM in the, the exhibit space, I did things like go into a World War I battle. I got to pretend to be a Wright Brothers on an airplane. I would I lie down on a table and pretend to take off in the plane. And we're getting to experience yeah. all these different ways that people are conceiving of not just what this might be, but these are things they actually want to offer into our spaces. Um, and it's helping us think about it at, at a much faster pace, and I'm seeing much more conversation about it. In fact, last week I was just at the Games for Change Festival in New York City. If um, our listeners are not familiar with it, it's uh, uh, 13 years old. This is the 13th uh, festival. It's an annual uh, event in New York City that goes across a number of days looking at um, how games can be used not just for entertainment. And so we've seen many threads over the years. You know, Games for Education is always strong. Uh, there was a games and, I think, brain science thread this year as well. But this was the first year that, and I'm not exaggerating, every single session I went to was about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, or some combination of them. And sometimes it was people from the gaming industry, someone from um, like Magic Leap uh, who's making a device, or Jesse Shell mm -hmm. who runs a gaming company talking about it. And sometimes it was educators mm -hmm. or someone like myself in museums. But everybody was talking about it. And there's a lot of new expectations around it. Uh, in fact, somebody tweeted uh, at the conference, they said, do you hear that? It's the sound of a bubble inflating. And it's true, we're getting big, big expectations around it. But there was also yeah. a report that came out recently that said that when people were asked what they expect from it, games are on there, but education was actually higher. So people have, in this one survey, they found people have higher expectations of mixed reality and augmented reality and all this having an impact on, in the education sphere even more than in the gaming space. I think that's something we well, get I'm to glad, try and speak to. Yes. 
And I'm glad you brought up impact because we actually have a question, which is actually uh-huh. being lobbed at us from um, Billy Wattenpaw of Zengald, who's the gentleman who lent me his, his HoloLens to try out at the annual <laughs> meeting. Thank you, Billy. And Thanks, he's Billy. asking about whether he knows of any studies that have been done to show an increase in engagement or shifts in behavior through the use of AR and VR. And one thing I came across in the course of writing TrendsWatch was the fact that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is actually putting a fair amount of uh, effort into studies to to t- uh, track the large-scale long-term effects of virtual reality on teaching empathy mm. because they want to foster a more empathetic society. There definitely is research that indicates that uh, augmented reality can change people's attitudes and behavior. So I think that that's one of the the both promising and disturbing things about the technology, because, of course, anything that can um, <laughs> manipulate attitudes and manipulate how we think about other people both has a tremendous potential for good, but also you know, can can be a dangerous form of manipulation. Um, yep. So it's, again, an literacy what, we're going to have to become aware of. Yeah. And arm yeah. ourselves with. Um, the, the app I was talking about before, Skin, uh, Skin and Bones, um, was developed yeah. by Diana Marquise, who's actually a graduate student, who developed this uh, as her uh, research uh, dissertation. Um, and if you go to mm-hmm. my blog, uh, mushmi.org, M-O-O-S-H-M-E.org, you can scroll down and you'll see a post called Skin in the Game. And so she talks mm-hmm. about the research that underlied um, why it was designed the way it was and what she was trying to um, study as a result. Um, it'll be, the study will be coming out in a few months. And I think uh, oh, work like cool. hers, um, creating um, VR and AR experiences in museums that are designed to help us understand um, how does it change the way visitors learn and interact with each other and with the museums themselves um, are going to be tremendously helpful for, for guiding this kind of work as we move forward. And I think that's one of the things that makes museums great partners for the technology industry in order to test real-world beneficial applications of their work. So we have a question coming in from Beverly Sensbach from the Florida Museum of Natural History. She would like you to give an example of a mixed reality experience and how it differs from augmented. So how does that fit into the terminology we've introduced? I'm so glad you asked because it's something I've been trying to get my head around as well. I really came across the term for me in a serious way um, two issues of Wired to go. Um, uh, if you don't read Wired, I recommend going to Wired.com and looking for the. I think it was the May issue. It was the cover article, uh, and Kevin Kelly, the um, one of the executive editors, um, tried every single tool he could uh, and wrote a wonderful piece about what he experienced. And in it, he used the term mixed reality a lot. Um, and mm-hmm. he was interviewing in part folks from Magic Leap. Um, and Graham Devine from Magic League spoke last week at Games for Change, and this is his definition. He says, mixed reality is the mixture of the real world and virtual worlds so that one understands the other. Now, all these things are about connecting the real and the virtual, but what I think um, Kevin Kelly and, and uh, Graham Devine are focusing on is the ability for the two spaces to be aware of each other. So let's talk about augmented reality. For micro rangers, you ha- have a coin that you hold, it's a special coin, and when you hold it and you hold your phone over it, you see characters that appear in your hand and talk to you. So in this case, all the phone is aware of, all the augmented reality is aware of is just the coin in your hand. It's not aware of your hand, it's not aware of what your hand's in front of, the rest of the world it's blind to. I think the idea of mixed reality is when the device can now not only observe the, the coin itself, but everything else in front of it. So the new devices now, like an HTC Vine, when you put them on, they are mapping out the entire space around you. The Microsoft HoloLens does the same thing. So rather than having something specific and discreet be the thing that can be the portal, essentially, into this magic virtual world, everything around you becomes a potential place for the, um, the computer to write onto. So it could be, once yeah. it's aware of my room, in this place it's going to put up a movie browser. Over here it's going to put up a Skype. Right. Uh, screen so Elizabeth and I can talk to each other. Over here, it's going to let me put a Minecraft table on top of uh, uh, my couch, let's say. And so mixed reality, in some ways, is just enhanced augmented reality, um, but I think it affords something in a new way that's exciting a lot of people. 
Yeah, so is this another example? I've been reading about the integration of haptics into augmented and virtual reality. So, for example, it's not just that you're seeing things, but you're feeling things, and you can use gestural control. So if I put on a haptics glove, for example, in a virtual reality environment with a virtual dog, I've seen a video of this, I could be petting the dog and fondling its ears and playing with its mouth, and the virtual dog would know what I'm doing because it's interacting with the signals from my hands, so it would respond appropriately. It, you know, be happy that I'm scratching its ears or jumping up and down or biting at my hand. So in this case, it's actually a responsive environment again. Is that another I example the terms of are shift based on, on I think the terms are going to shift based on how we need them. If the adding the haptics is about having different mediums of experience and yeah. having a term that describes not just the visual and the audio, but the tactile as well, um, yeah. that might be where we go. But I think we're going to see in the next few years, we're going to go through a number of terms. Uh, we're going to, you know, virtual worlds, uh, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. At the end of the day, I think what, what's most important for us in the museum space is to think about what kind of experiences are we trying to create and what can the, yeah. the tools support. And different tools will support different types of experiences. If the haptic is important uh, because you want visitors to experience, say, what happens when an earthquake uh, appears or their emotional shift if, if it's being measured when they touch a virtual dog, um, then you'll look for tools that support that. Uh, for people who are designing the games and people who are designing the tools, um, the people designing the technology and the code, it's really important for them to be able to distinguish in, in their space these different tools. I think for us at the end of the day, say let them uh, hash out what it's going to be called. Uh, and for us, as long as we're focusing on the impact it has on the social uh, in our spaces, um, that's going to get us the farthest. Cool. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up this part of our discussion. I'm going to ask you to stay on the line, Barry, because our next subject is happiness, and I think that we're going to find that that topic may actually intersect with the potential of, a of AR and VR. So um, I look forward to you jumping back in in a little bit. Sounds good. I'll hang out in the green room and call me when you want me to come back in. Great. Okay. So. The next topic that our hosts from Blackbaud uh, invited me to address in a little more depth here in our webinar today is the section of the Trends Watch report that looks at happiness as an alternative metric of success. And the reason I started writing about this, frankly, is that I've been kind of fed up with the fact that, at least in Western society, we seem so fixated on money as a way of telling us how successful an organization or a person is. You know, if you make a high salary, you're more important than somebody who makes a low salary. If your company generates a lot of, a lot of profits, you're obviously more successful than a company that doesn't generate so much profit. And that immediately disadvantages nonprofits where we're not putting the generation of a lot of, of money at, at the top of our list of things we're trying to achieve. We're trying to create, make the world a better place in a lot of ways that may not involve uh, generating money, <laughs> unfortunately, either for the people who work there and certainly not for a set of investors. And the sort of culmination of this money is the ultimate metric is reflected in how nations um, strut their stuff and show off how successful they are. And I'm putting up here uh, an example of the U.S. gross domestic product. So how, how is the U.S. doing? How is it doing compared to Germany or China or Japan? We compare gross domestic products. Well, I was very encouraged as I dug into the literature to find that more and more people and organizations and countries are pushing back at financial metrics. It's the only way of measuring success. And they're starting to layer on alternate measures that privilege things like well-being and happiness and peace of mind. So for example, uh, Almost uh, over a decade ago, Bhutan started floating the idea of a gross national happiness index, saying we may not be the richest country in the world, we may not be the most productive country in the world, but we think we have a high quality of living for our people. And there are ways to measuring that uh, in terms of well-being. Now, you may or may not agree with specifically how Bhutan's measuring it or whether they're really living up to that promise, but more and more countries, uh, France, Great Britain, are beginning to adopt elements of that measure and layering it on top of financial success as a way of looking at whether they're actually providing well for their citizens. I think this is a fabulous metric for museums because it allows us to pivot from something 
that is a, a byproduct of what we do, which is perhaps generating economic impact, and centering on what we're trying to do, which is delivery of mission. Now, our mission isn't always to make people happy, but I think a lot of what we do in creating the experiences we, we create do improve well-being and impact on things like personal happiness. And beginning to mainstream that into our operations as something we're consciously trying to create and capture can help us challenge funders and governments to accept us on our own terms of success. Now, I have to say this is aided by the fact that people are finding that, in fact, if you focus on making people happy, you also, as a byproduct, tend to make them more productive and make companies more profitable. There's a lot of interesting research out there. I have one graph up on the screen now showing that if you focus on the happiness of your employees, you reduce expensive and costly things like burnout and turnover and absenteeism and you increase people's feelings of pride about their workplace and you improve their job performance and their customer service so that in fact, by focusing on happiness as an outcome, you also tangentially improve your financial metrics, which is makes it easier to make the case to administration. I think that one of the reasons that there's been pushback against adopting happiness and well-being as official metrics in organizations or in government has been that it seems very squishy. You know, oh, are we making people happy? How do you measure that? And I think that one of the things behind the increasing adoption and acceptance of happiness as a valid metric is the fact that we're beginning to study it scientifically. So that uh, you have, for example, people doing brain scans of Buddhist monks to show that when they're focusing on meditation and well-being, you can actually see how it's changing the activity of their brains. I actually the other day came across um, a mathematical article uh, that was not only establishing that there is a formula to predict happiness, but modifying an existing formula to account for uh, your awareness of how you're doing relative to others. So this is actually a mathematical formula to capture uh, predictively whether somebody's going to be happy. And um, it's recently been updated to show that you're more likely to be happy if you're aware that, that uh, other people are doing well too, which is, is uh, very altruistic of us. I'm very encouraged when I started to write Trends Watch to go out into the museum realm. Uh, I never write about a trend until I begin to find museums that are, are taking advantage of this trend, responding to this trend, doing something around them. And I very quickly came across a, a couple of major projects tackling this head on, one of which was the Happy Museum Project in the UK, which is uh, working with a number of museums in, in their country to try and measure how they affect the well-being of their communities. And somewhat closer to home, uh, I stumbled across the fact that the Museum of Vancouver had hosted Stephen Sagmeister's Happy Show, uh, which was uh, that artist's meditation on what makes him happy. But what really intrigued me was the museum's motivation for doing the show, at least as it was reflected in the press, which is there were apparently studies that showed that, that, that Vancouver was not a particularly happy city. And the Museum of Vancouver, which is, seems to me from my reading is very, very community-centric and very dedicated to serving its city, uh, said, well, what could we do about that? Maybe there's something that we as a museum can do to increase the happiness of our community. Which is why I invited Greg Dreiser from MOVE to join us today to tell us more about that work. So, Greg, do you want to come on, on board now, out of the green room? Yes. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. I'm really looking forward to this chance to chat um, and share the conversation with others because um, there's so much more I want to know about the Museum of Vancouver's work in this area, um, much of which, as you know, I, I only am familiar with through reading press accounts and, and through the, uh, the little bit you've been nice enough to write for me and contribute to the blog. Yes. Well, you know, we, we brought uh, Stefan Zagmeister's Happy Show here is kind of kicking off our new focus on looking at people's uh, sense of happiness. And, you know, as you said, um, individual happiness, it's, it's very interesting. People know if they're happy, you know, in the moment, and they know if they're happy kind of long term, but they don't 
know necessarily what makes them happy. Like we don't do things necessarily that make us happy, even though we think we know what makes us happy. So there's a big element of surprise and and it's quite easy to engage people in thinking about it just by actually showing them various uh, methods or strategies for becoming happier. Now, the, the real, I think the crux, the real key for me was that if people connect with others, they're happier as individuals. But if they connect with others, they're also increasing the well-being of their communities. And so it's really a special uh, special insight because there are really probably relatively few people who are going to have the time or the motivation to go out there, volunteer, do things to improve their community. I wish there were more. But just in fact, just by doing what makes you happy, you can actually help uh, help communities. And um, why is that? Well, when you look at things like uh, health, sustainability, you know, resilience, which is the ability of communities or people to bounce back after something bad, you know, a disaster, all of that is actually related to social connection. So there is this important link between, you know, individual happiness, because individual happiness is often driven by our connection to others, and then the way that helps strengthen a community. So this is really interesting. So you're saying that there are, there are measurable increases in, in community happiness and well-being, even if it's just from the increased individual happiness of people, even if they're not interacting with each other around that? Yes. I mean, for example, after disasters, um, when they've studied which communities are able to bounce back, the ones that have stronger social ties are actually the ones mm -hmm. that bounce back quicker. And it's interesting. It's better for – so it's better for everyone if they're more connected – to their neighbors, basically. And it's also better for city and governments realize this. They don't have the resources to actually be there. You know, after an earthquake or a flood, um, there's not going to be a team waiting for each uh, family, waiting to save each family. It's actually much more important for you to know your neighbors. And so, yes, it's, it's, that, um, it, it's those relationships which are really critical for community strength. So what sort of role do you think museums in general, or the Museum of Vancouver in particular, can play in creating those kinds of community connections? Yeah. Well, there's a, a lot of concern in Vancouver, and I think Vancouver is really in the forefront of, of the cities that are looking at, at this issue. Um, it was kicked off in 2012. The Vancouver Foundation published a study on connection, connection in the city. And then, actually, the government took it up. The mayor established a special task force. And there are actually now very large plans for the city, including the Healthy City Strategy, which the core of which actually focuses on connection. And so I feel that you know whether in your in your trends watch you mention you know individual happiness. I think it's great if someone comes to a museum and is ha you know happier as a result. Um, we we definitely want people to to be inspired or to learn things. You know, maybe they'll leave sadder from a, you know visiting a museum, but but inspired. But I think what's really critical is this the social connection piece that we can help people. First of all, just understand why connection is so important. It, it's you know it's easy to assume it's obvious, but um, there are a lot of there are a lot of aspects that people just don't realize. So helping people learn a little bit about why connection is important, but also helping them or inspiring them to connect. And so the benefit then is really for, you know, for the community. And that's, I think, part of our larger strategy, which is really you know, community engagement in the sense that our, our vision is about helping the community rather than you know, being kind of internally focused, which is a way some museums still are, it's a traditional way museum, you know, Looking internally, saying we're you know we have collections because we need to for posterity we need to preserve collections. Instead, we can say we're going to use collections to actually help connect people with each other, help them create stories together, for example. So I think our focus on you know on happiness and well-being is actually about helping to strengthen the community. Mm -hmm. 
So is this taking you in a continued direction at the museum? Was, it, was the, the Happy Show pretty much a one-off, or is this inspired um, continued work? Oh, yeah. No, not at all. This kind of, I guess it was kind of the kickoff. We are in many ways um, going to, in, in everything we do, we're in particular looking at creating connections. Um, I, probably uh, many of the listeners know bridging and bonding is a kind of academic term uh, for what we're looking at, which is bringing individuals and really bringing groups of people together. So we're actually integrating this into every every project that we do. For example, we just opened an exhibition called All Together Now, which looks at collectors, actually um, a variety of collectors of very unusual objects in Vancouver. And we're looking at it from the perspective of collecting is connecting. When people collect, they're, they're immediately connecting with others to, to acquire their collections, to show their co collections, and then to connect with other collectors, and then to sh you know connect with a wider public. So we're, we're taking that angle from kind of the individual collector level, and then we're also bringing together regional institutions to look at how our collecting plans might connect with each other, you know, how, how we uh, collaborate, and also how we can bring in local communities who are interested in collecting objects themselves, and so we can bring people together um, that way. Um, another example is we're working on a project uh, tentatively in, uh, entitled Trust, because trust is really a, a basic condition for, for relationships. It's not the only thing you need to have a good relationship, but without it, you don't really have a, a firm or reliable relationship. And that runs from individuals to banking, you know, to who fixes your car, um, real estate, every aspect of society, police. So what we're, what we're going to do is, and actually thanks to a grant we just received from the Vancouver Foundation, we're going to do an unusual project where we're engaging with uh, people who are uh, have been designated as isolated, in particular um, newcomers, and Vancouver is a city, three quarters of the people who live in Vancouver were not born, were not born in the province of British Columbia. And also um, young people, because interesting, young adults also report feeling very isolated. Vancouver is an extremely diverse city and there are a lot of people moving in and out and a lot of change and as many people know, it's one of the most expensive places to live in the world, so there's a lot of anxiety and people feeling disconnected. And so we're going to work with the uh, isolated groups to develop, to actually look at stories, develop stories, and see what the key, um, you could say, key factors or, or events or situations. And then we're going to collaborate with designers and artists and build on those stories and working with communities to create. Um, a variety of events, you know, what are called events and programs, and then eventually actually create an exhibition that's going to revolve around um, stories about trust and engaging people in learning about trust, um, you know, being inspired to interact with each other, and um, actually maybe create, you know, create real relationships. And we're working closely um, with the city because the city is also form trying to figure out how they can do what they want to do and need to do here in terms of connection. And so we're hoping to be able also to actually monitor impact, you know, which obviously is, is a really important. I think obviously it's difficult to, to test whether people are going to be happier. Um, it's very, you know, um, attitudes and behaviors are really hard to, to monitor long term. But there are, there are ways that we can indicate and, and monitor whether people are more connected, and which uh, we hope to do. This is very interesting because you're you're really expanding and riffing on the same topic, which is important outcomes that are non-financial metrics of success. So we've expanded it from happiness to well-being to well-being to resilience, from resilience to trust, and they're all interconnected in some way to some degree. Yes. It's, a yes. it's a really thorny knot. I know one of the most disturbing pieces of research I've read in the past few years was some research that showed that as communities become more diverse, trust goes down. That's just really depressing. Because if we're talking about trying to, to create city, well, with an increasing number of people living in cities and with the increasing rate of migration and, and moving of populations around the world, uh, we're going to have more diverse communities that need their resilience and need their well-being. And if that kind of bringing together of people of different backgrounds and, and religions and experiences decreases trust, it undermines their ability 
to, to cope and be resilient as a community. The thought that a museum could help counteract that to build trust is, is I find, very, um, very encouraging. Yes, and, you know, it's an interesting point that you bring up because, you know, everyone's always talking about community in a positive way, which they should. However, by definition, community means exclusion. If you're defining a community, you're, then there are people who are in it and there are people who are out of it. And, yeah. I mean, that has been basic. You know, that's basically what a city is. You know, people talk about beyond the pale, for example, pale mm-hmm. being the kind of fence that surrounded a city. So cohesion also means exclusion. But I do think, as you said, that a museum can play a really uh, great role in bringing together groups that actually would not meet or maybe have difference and doing that, you know, with individuals as well as groups. And I think, you know, again, museum being a trusted institution can play a really, a really special role and have a, really have an impact in, in, in how strong the community is, how resilient. Well, I'm going to be encouraging people in the audience to start lobbing questions at you and or me and Barry. But I'm going to start out with one that we talked about earlier um, before we started the recording, which is um, have you seen uh, – one of the things I mentioned in the report is the fact that museums might want to think about promoting the happiness of their own staff uh, so thinking about this as an internal metric as well as an external metric. Um, and in part, this ties to the whole question of what nonprofits uh, can pay and what they can't pay and how they can be awesome workplaces um, that may have payoffs beyond the financial. Did you have any discussions in the museum and – excuse me, because I'm dropping this one on you cold, but any discussions yeah. in the museum during the course of these projects about how to increase or measure or track happiness or well-being internally? Yeah. We haven't yet addressed that here. It's a great question and um, still one to be determined. Um, we do, um, I'm working with a, a well-known social practice artist, Justin Longlois. He's a partner in the Trust Project. And one thing that we are focusing on for the project itself is actually making sure that we're building trust among the partners because there are going to be so many people involved at different levels. So we are thinking about uh, that at at that level. But at the museum level um, here in Vancouver, we haven't yet done that. I can say, though, this is my own perspective that, you know, I think a lot for many museums, you know, the happiness, if you want to call it that, the happiness or well-being level is coming from the top. And so I think... For boards, you know, governance, boards should keep a close eye on, on the leadership of the institutions because that's something that is, comes down from the top, and, and if, if that's not being carefully monitored, there are going to be issues. Yeah, that makes total sense. The other thing I've been reading about is the, uh, about the connection between the physical built environment and people's well-being and happiness. And I listened to a really interesting podcast the other week on Jacob Morgan's Future of Work podcast where he was interviewing Tim Oldman, who's um, the CEO of a a company called Leesman that goes around auditing um, the relationship between employees in the physical space they work in. Yes. And they, he was sharing some – so, so um, Jacob Morgan was pushing him on what sort of the strongest correlation to, to happy, productive employees who feel good about their, uh, their, the organization they work for. And I was really encouraged to hear that some of the things he was talking about really are things that don't require a huge amount of money necessarily, but more just thoughtful design, because some of the strongest influencers were having, uh, first of all, social – workspaces, so shared spaces to, to hang out and have informal encounters with people, to have a variety of different workspaces, and to have flexibility about choice about where you worked going in. So, you know, I'm not just going to necessarily sit down in, in my cubicle today. There's nothing inherently wrong with cubicles, uh, but that I might, I might go work in a kitchen today. I might go hang out in this um, lounge area where we're going to have flexible uh, Wi-Fi in places where I can drop in. I might go to this little conference room for a, for a small team meeting. Um, I might even go out to the local coffee shop and work there. So a lot of it seemed to be about giving people choices and control over their environment. And that seemed to me to be something that could be implemented in design, even in um, relatively small organizations. Yes, 
I agree that it's um, on a you know in 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 the office world, the design of of workspaces you know is critical. I'm not sure a lot of people would agree with you that cubicles are okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, that aside, um, the design environmental design is critical, even on a bigger scale. For example, um, Charles Montgomery, who wrote the book Happy City, and now is consulting actually all over the world with governments about design and happiness, and he's based here in Vancouver. Um, he, he, his book actually goes into depth about how our surroundings affect affect us. And for anyone who works in a museum, actually this, this isn't news because, you know, for any exhibition, creating the environment is, is the key thing. If, if you, you know, if you want to create a memory pressure on someone, it's all about creating an environment that people, that's going to really touch people. It's so, multi-sensory, yeah. Correct, and it's interesting. Um, there's a there's a project we're, we're going to be actually we're going to be doing a series of kind of symposium conferences on different aspects of social connection, and one of them will be uh, collaborating with Charles Montgomery, where he, he's looking at high-rise buildings, you know, and multi multi-unit buildings. You know, people in Vancouver, there are a lot of them, and many cities, obviously, but are they actually are they designed for people to connect? I mean. Mostly, if you talk to developers, it's not even on their minds. Many of them, you know, it, it's just about getting as you know, getting the most return for your dollar. But how are people actually? Are they being? Are they connecting? Are they lonely right. in, in those buildings? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because one of the other factors the Leesman Index uncovered um, that is a matter of having money to some extent is that the strongest predictor of of employees feeling uh, high well-being and happiness and productivity was a big foyer space in the building, which, of course, is, is low density, absolutely useless when it looks at any kind of objective utility, but somehow they haven't dug into the cause and effect that makes people feel good about the building and about the space they're in. Yes. Yep. Well, since we're... I, mean, we're, we're I was just going to... As we, as we continue, I was going to encourage Barry to jump in because it seems to me that this is circling back to the question of sensory perceptions and and your experience of, of what you're um, perceiving in a space opens the door to think about how AR and VR experiences have effects on emotion as well, including happiness and well-being and potentially trust, sure. since we were talking about VR as empathy engines. First, I want to thank you for the virtual seltzer in the green room. It was really refreshing. <laughs> Yeah, well, Greg, well, you, and Greg were speaking. It was hard for me not to notice that you know one of the things you're focusing on in part is how important it is um, to support connections in society, and one of the roles that museums play in helping people to build those connections. And what we, you and I were talking about earlier, Elizabeth, is one of the, the ways we can think about the, the important role that things like for VR and AR can have in museums is to help people make, build, make those connections with each other. And then perhaps in museums, that's not the place to do things that are about breaking those connections. That might be fine at home. Um, I did like playing that Cracker Jacks game, I should mention. I did it in my office by myself. It, it worked. That was appropriate time for me to do it by myself, but when I was with my family, watching the baseball game, when I was with my family at the museum, I was there to make memories. I was there to build connections with them. Um, and having an augmented tool, it gave me a new resource to do that or just an opportunity or a new activity to do that um, enhanced my experience and my family's experience in the museum, and perhaps that, that made us happier. So for me, it's, it's just bringing the conversation full circle. Technology, not just AR and VR, technology to the extent that it helps us connect with those around us, with those we love, with our friends, and potentially even make connections with those we don't know, with strangers, with those different from us. Those are, I think, very beneficial, powerful ways that we can be supporting technology in our social and civic spaces. Um, and we should be concerned at places where the technology is making us disconnect. The, the one thing I would say around that is it's sometimes difficult to know what's going on. Um, Graham Devine um, from Magic Leap was actually talking about his experience in a museum when he was at Games for Change, seeing a whole bunch of students sitting in front of a beautiful piece of art in an art museum looking at their cell phones. And he thought, ah, look at this mobile device. It's disconnecting them from the art. But then when he went up to see what they were doing, he saw that they were actually part of a class using an augmented reality experience where they were actually interacting with the art. And this was just a moment when they were looking at the phone instead of looking at the, the, the device. But the device was actually having them connect with the art and with each other. So sometimes it's hard when we're outside the experience to know what's going on 
and I find I have to reserve my judgment sometimes until I can see what is people, how are people experiencing what the technology is affording them in that space. Super. Well, I think that's a great that's a great way of bringing it full circle because it's pointing out that um, any technology is a tool, and any tool needs to be deployed towards a certain end. And we need to be thinking about what are the effects that we're trying to produce with those tools, whether it's social connections, whether it's well-being and happiness, whether it's fostering trust. And there are new AR and VR tools for working on that, and there are the old, also the old-fashioned ways that museums have done it for centuries. So I think we're getting the high sign that we should be wrapping up. Is that correct, Laura? That is correct, Elizabeth. I just wanted to take a minute, as I thank you all for joining us, to point you towards more places that you can find great content contributed by people like Greg and Barry and people from across the field and some of my thoughts as well. Uh, there is, it's all compiled at the AAM website. You can shortcut the CFM portions by going to www.futureofmuseums.org. We have blog posts, several of them a week, over at Blogspot. You can find me on Twitter where I push out links to everything I possibly can that I think is an interesting read. If you're more of a visual person, you can check out Pinterest where I pin interesting images of things going on in the world. And uh, on YouTube where I feature videos of people who are willing to put themselves on film talking about their visions of the future. Whatever Thank you, you can do, to get, into, get into Elizabeth's stream. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Barry. And thank you, Laura, and thank you, Blackbaud, for hosting us today. Well, on behalf of the Blackbaud Arts and Cultural team, thank you guys so much, Elizabeth, Barry, Gregory, for joining us today. And thank you for everyone who joined to listen in as well. I hope you're leaving here today with fresh ideas and inspiration that you can take back to your organization. And then finally, if you haven't yet, be sure to check out our site, arts.blackbaud.com, for resources, news, and more webinars and events like this one, specifically for arts and cultural organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.